Hello, today we are continuing with our series on GCSE physics revision, looking at nuclear fusion. Now last time we did nuclear fission. Fission was where a very large atom, such as uranium, splits up into two smaller atoms. It also produces, if you remember, three neutrons, but it also produces, and this was the key thing, energy. And that energy could be used to heat water or carbon dioxide in order to drive a turbine, in order to produce energy, electrical energy. That's fission. Today we're going to look at fusion, which is the other way around. With fusion, you take two small atoms and you fuse them together to make a bigger atom. In principle, you could take two hydrogen atoms and fuse them together to form the next... Hydrogen, I should say, is the lightest atom. It has one proton in the nucleus. And you could fuse these together to form helium, which is the next lightest atom with two protons in the nucleus. Sadly, it's not quite that easy because helium, as you may remember from our previous videos, has two protons and two neutrons in the nucleus, but hydrogen only has protons. So where are you going to get the neutrons from? Well, you could look for some isotopes of hydrogen. An isotope of hydrogen is called deuterium, and deuterium has one proton and one neutron in the nucleus. And you could fuse that with ordinary hydrogen, which has just one proton and no neutrons, and you could produce an isotope of helium, which has two protons and three neutron, uh, sorry, three nucleons, which is protons plus neutrons, plus energy. Now, why is that? Well, it's exactly the same reason as it was for nuclear fission. If you were to weigh the deuterium atom, which is this one, plus the hydrogen atom, which is this one, you would find that it would be just slightly heavier than the helium atom that you produce. So there is another mass deficit. This is heavier, this is lighter, we've lost some mass. Where has the mass gone? Well, in exactly the same way as before, Einstein's formula E equals mc squared has converted it into energy. And you remember I told you that the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So c squared is an even larger number, 9 times 10 to the 16. And even if you have a very small mass, when you multiply that by such a large number, you get a great deal of energy. Now the thing about fusion is you get a much larger mass deficit per atom than you do for fission. So fusion uh, reactions, as it were, are capable of producing much more energy per atom than you get from nuclear fission. Moreover, none of these things is radioactive. Deuterium, hydrogen, helium, not radioactive. In practice, for commercial use of nuclear fusion, you sometimes have to use another isotope of hydrogen, which is called tritium. This has one proton and two neutrons, making three total of protons and neutrons. Tritium is radioactive, that's the shame, but it can be reused. It's not a waste product, it just gets recycled. So in that sense, it's much better than the fission reactions where both the source and the waste products are radioactive. And the fuel source that you need, the deuterium and the hydrogen, couldn't be simpler. This is a feature of water. Water is H2O, where the H is the hydrogen. So you've only got to go down to the sea and bring back a bucket of water, and you've got the fuel that you need for fusion reactions. There will be deuterium in that water. Fusion is what is happening in the sun all the time. The sun, and indeed all stars, are simply a ball of hydrogen. 
They are so hot that the hydrogen is ionized. You remember that I said when we did the states of matter that there is solid, liquid and gas. And then there's another state called a plasma. And a plasma arises where the energy is so great because the temperature is so high that the electrons have enough energy to escape the atoms. And you are then left with just the nucleus of atoms. And the nucleus consists of positively charged protons and uh, neutrons. Well, in this case, if all you've got is hydrogen and you lose the electron from the hydrogen, you're left with just the nucleus of hydrogen, which is one proton. So essentially, the sun is just a huge ball of protons. And what the sun does all day is convert protons into neutrons. And then when it's got two proton, uh, when it's got the protons and the neutrons, it can take any two protons and mix them with any two neutrons to produce helium. And that is the process that's going on in the sun. And in the, and in the process of doing all that, you get a huge amount of energy. And that's what the sun shines with, the heat, the light, all the other electromagnetic radiation is coming out of a fusion reaction that produces energy. So just to remind you of an earlier video, we said that a proton can become a neutron plus a positron plus a neutrino. And what is actually happening is that the three quarks in the proton, which are an up, up, down, become three quarks up, down, down in the neutron. But it is the process of exchanging an up quark for a down quark, which is responsible for the production of the positron and the neutrino. The positron is necessary because you start with a positively charged proton, you produce a neutral neutron, something's got to carry that positive charge away, it's the positron, which is the antimatter version of the electron. And of course, what happens in the sun is that the positron will very quickly meet up with one of those electrons that was ionized, and the two will meet and they will collide and annihilate and produce gamma rays. The neutrinos, billions and billions and billions of them, fly out of the sun, they fly towards the earth, they actually travel right through the earth, they travel through you. Every second, millions of neutrinos are flying through you, but you don't ever notice because they don't interact with us. So there's no way of telling. And then what happens in the sun all the time is that you take the protons that were already there, plus the neutrons that you have manufactured by converting protons into neutrons. And essentially, if you take two protons, plus two neutrons, you manufacture helium plus energy. And that's the energy that makes the sun shine. So that's essentially all that happens in the sun. Protons are converted into neutrons, and then the protons and the neutrons combine to form helium. So for 10 billion years, the sun, which is primarily hydrogen, is converting more and more of the hydrogen into helium. We'll see more about this when we see how stars work when we come on to cosmology. Well, so far, we've painted a rosy picture. According to me, all you need is a bucket of water, and you've got all the fuel you need to produce helium plus energy. And that energy can be used to produce electricity. What could be simpler? There's an a plentiful, almost unlimited supply of water, that's the raw product. What could go wrong? Well, I'm afraid there is one big downside. And the fact that this happens in the sun may give you a clue. You need to operate at massively high temperatures, something of the order of 10 million degrees. Why? Because in essence, what you're trying to do is to take two protons and push them together so that they fuse. You're also, of course, taking two neutrons 
but that's easier. There's no electric charge there, so there's no resistance. But like charges, these are two protons, these are two positive charges, like charges repel. There is a force between these two protons that is pushing them apart. And the closer you get together, the greater that force will be. So great, in fact, that it's almost irresistible. And the only way you can get those two protons to fuse, the only way you can get them close enough so that they can be bound in a helium nucleus is if you take the temperatures up to something like 10 million degrees so the protons have enough energy to overcome what's called the Coulomb um, electromagnetic force of repulsion. Well, it is possible to get up to 10 million degrees centigrade. Um, you would do so by passing a current, which of course is going to produce heating. You probably need something like 1 million amps. So you need a very high current to produce a very high temperature. But now you've got a problem. You've now got a ball of hydrogen at 10 million degrees centigrade. And the question is, what are you going to put it in? There is no container that will hold something at 10 million degrees centigrade. It would melt. Indeed, it would probably boil as well. However, we're a bit fortunate now because, of course, as I've told you, at these kind of temperatures, the gas becomes a plasma. That is, it's ionised. All the electrons have enough energy to escape the atoms, and so you're essentially left with just positively charged atoms. And if you've got a positively charged plasma, you don't actually need to put it in anything. You can, as it were, suspend it in space by the appropriate adjustment of magnetic fields. Now, it's a lot more complicated than this, but basically what is happening is that positively charged material is suspended, not in any container, but just hanging in space because of the effect of magnetic and indeed electric fields. But clearly you're going to need very, very strong fields in order to um, keep the uh, plasma suspended where you want it. So the problems can be overcome. You can indeed get the uh, gas up to a temperature of 10 million degrees with a very high current. You can indeed suspend it in air um, or space with the use of electric and magnetic fields. And that is exactly what happens in the fusion reactor, which is called the JET, the Joint European Taurus. This plasma, when it is suspended, is called Taurus. But here's the big downside. The problem is that up till now, you've had to use more energy to produce this system than you get out. In other words, the amount of energy you need for a current of 1 million amps to get the temperature up to 10 million degrees, plus the energy you need to put in in order to provide the very heavy magnetic fields that are going to suspend the plasma in space, is more than the electricity that you generate from the heat that you get from the uh, fusion reactions. So a reactor that takes more energy than it delivers is, I'm afraid, no good. Now, it always seems to be that the technological problems will be overcome, depending on who you listen to, in 20 years or 50 years. When I was a student, people were saying, we'll have cracked this technological problem in 20 years. And I was a student more than 20 years ago. And still, depending on who you talk to, they say, well, we'll crack it, but it'll take 20 or 50 years. What are the issues with this system? Well, firstly, obviously, you've got these very, very high temperatures, so you are always going to be subject to the risk of fire. If the magnets suddenly pack up, you get a power cut, um, then this will no longer be suspended and you'll have a gas at 10 million degrees falling onto the ground. That's very dangerous, so you can have a fire. But fires are generally easier to control than out-of-control nuclear reactors. So in this sense, this is a better risk than an out-of-control nuclear um, chain reaction. Of course, it's also the case that it's non-radioactive. I mentioned that some of the 
systems use tritium, which is radioactive, but that is recycled, so it's not a waste product. There is, of course, a problem that just like with the fission reactors, you can use um, this to make bombs. So you can, with the fusion system, make a fusion bomb, or sometimes called a hydrogen bomb. Essentially, you, you need to use a fission reaction first to create the high temperatures, and then you get the fusion reaction as well. But those are the basic um, issues. And of course, as we've said, you've got a plentiful, if not inexhaustible, supply of the fuel in the form of water. Wouldn't it be good if all of this could be done at room temperature? That's called cold fusion. You don't have to heat it up to 10 million degrees. It just happens at room temperature. Well, it would be nice, but there is no way of doing that yet. But maybe somebody watching this video will be inspired to continue with their education, go into research, and go on to develop a method by which fusion reactors can be used to generate lots more energy, lots more electricity, than they need to make them work. And if you can do that, you'll have solved the world's energy problems for thousands of years to come a plentiful supply of the basic resource and a huge amount of energy being generated by the fusion of essentially hydrogen into helium. And if one of you does do that and gets all the credit, I hope that in some small way you may acknowledge my tiny input into that process.